Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman. We're continuing in our midweek studies in the book of Acts. Specifically, we're looking at Acts chapter 20, verses 32 to 38. And this is for a uh, meeting date of April 21st, 2021. But it's published live on Facebook. We are live on Facebook Live right now as I publish this. And will be available ahead of time on our YouTube channel. Before we start, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us in what we do. Father God, we thank you again for Jesus, for eternal life, and everything you do for us. Work in our lives, and through the uh, word of God that we will be looking at today, that we may be challenged and encouraged uh, as part of your church, your called out people. And pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So follow with me, please, as we read, starting in verse 32 of Acts chapter 20. It says this, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all of them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most for all of all for the words which he spoke, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem. He is going back in the small s spirit. It's his spirit. He's going to be warned again in the coming chapter that he should not be going back, but still he will go back. And God, in his permissive will, allows it. Because God will allow for this to happen in order for God to use this time for Paul to go to Rome and preach the gospel in Rome. And he will do this coming up. Now, some people wonder about how sad all these people were here. Why would God allow them to be so sad? The title of this message is Tearful Goodbyes. But I want to tell you that tearful goodbyes are temporary things. We say goodbye to many people. Recently I attended the uh, funeral of a friend, close friend, who uh, I've known for a number of years, who attended one of our uh, early Bible studies here in Ottawa when we first got here more than 33 years ago now. And he passed away. Cancer sadly took him. Um, and um, he was is missed by his family. It was a tearful goodbye that day. But the tearful goodbye is a temporary thing. Because we know for certain that if you are a follower, as was my friend, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have asked to be born again, as I heard it put by one particular pastor on, online just recently, he said this, if you're born twice, you die once. But if you're born once, you will die twice. You will physically die here, and then you will be resurrected to come before the judgment. It is the great white throne of judgment. Believers will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for their service for God. Unbelievers will come before the great white throne of judgment. You find that at the end of the book of Revelation, where they will be asked, why their name is not in the Lamb's book of life, and they will not be allowed into God's eternal kingdom. Now, there's something about tears, and the tears that we have here can be explained um, by the prophet Isaiah, and I want to have you go to Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8 for a moment. It says here in this verse, in Isaiah 25, verse 8, this, He will swallow up death, in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall be he take away from all of off all of the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. This is looking forward in time. However, in the immediate context of where Isaiah is teaching here, he is speaking about immediately there's a reproach that's coming upon Israel, but God will remove it, and he will take away the tears of remembrance. That's what it means. He will wipe away every tear. It means taking away the tears of remembrance. Israel would have removed from them if they would become true followers of God 
the tears of remembrance, the sad, sadness of knowing of how they didn't serve God and the consequences of deportation, first by the Assyrians and, and deportation and conquest by the Assyrians in 722 and the Babylonians in 586 BC. But there's coming a time future for all of mankind. And God says this to all of us, including those who are outside of his called out people, the called out people known as the church today, because there's still time to change your mind about Jesus. The promise is this, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen one day. When Jesus comes back to remove the church out of this world just prior to his time of judgment, known as the 70th week of Daniel, known as the time of Jacob's trouble by Jeremiah the prophet, after that, God will save that remnant of the people of the house of Israel. And there will be people, even after the church has been removed, who will come to faith in Jesus. You see, 144,000, read this in the book of Revelation, will go out and preach the gospel to the Gentile world, Revelation chapter 7. And two witnesses will come to preach the gospel to Israel. Read that in the book of Revelation. I believe them to be Moses and Elijah. And they will, the gospel will be, will be preached worldwide during the time of Jacob's trouble, the worst time in all of human history. But the promise is this, that if you turn to Jesus, ask for his atoning work on that cross to be applied to your life personally, the promise is this, that you have the absolute assurance of eternal life. Now let's go to this passage for a moment. Here in the context of time, Early in the history of the church, Paul is concluding his missionary journey. He's on his way back to Jerusalem where he will face uh, certain circumstances that are beyond his control. Now he has told him in the verses leading up here in Acts chapter 20, prior to verse 32, that his concern is that grievous wolves will come into the church and will try to ravage the church from within. We've seen that throughout the history of the church. Grievous wolves referring to basically false teachers with only one thing in mind, their own personal gain. And Paul warns about this. The only way for one to make certain that they do not fall victim to the sordid gain of false teachers is to do what Paul told Timothy. Study to show thyself approved, a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth is God's word. To divide it rightly means to understand it clearly. And we are literalists in our teaching of the word, and we divide the word rightly. Now he says this. Look at verse 32. Paul is saying this to these believers. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Sanctified. If you're a follower of the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, you are sanctified. You are set apart from the rest of the world. However, he says this, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. The word of his grace is the power of the salvation that comes through Jesus. We are saved by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man boast. We have not done it. We have not saved ourselves. God, in the person of Jesus, I've said it often like this, the most miraculous thing that ever happened in all of human history is that God became a human being like you and me and willingly went to die in my place, your place. His execution on that cross was God in the human flesh, willing to die in place of you. That is true salvation. Believing in that, this is the word of his grace, it says here. It's able to build you up. In other words, to encourage you, to make you into more of what he wants you to be. To give you an inheritance. That inheritance is eternal life. And to, among all of them which are sanctified, set apart. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, you are set apart. As we continue in this portion here of Acts 20, 32 to 38, understand clearly that Paul is saying, yes, I've warned you about grievous wolves coming in, but now 
I want you to understand you are set apart, sanctified. That is as applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this. You're a set apart person. And then he goes on and talks about himself, and this is his witness of his ministry. Look at verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. In other words, I've had no desire to have the things of other people, the things of this world. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to live a light life of ascetism. God is not telling you to go and find a rough robe and wear that for the rest of your life and live as if you were a hermit up on top of a hill. God would still have you to have the things in this life. He just doesn't want you to be coveting things of other people. In other words, he wants you to have the right attitude and the right uh, approach to things in life. The things of this life are temporary, and God will eventually end this world. And I've heard it said before at funerals, and I've said it before at funerals that I've officiated at, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul yet. He goes on in verse 34, Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered. Means uh, What it means here, this word ministered, uh, literally means have provided for um, my necessities. In other words, he has supported himself. Now, he has had support from others. But to, um, to the most part, he was a tent maker. And we have various missionaries today who work as tent making missionaries. We are faith missionaries here. We trust the Lord through his people to provide for our needs. And God has been gracious to us over 33, 34 years of ministry to provide and meet our needs. And so, you see, we don't covet other men's wealth. There's a future wealth that is beyond what the capabilities of us understanding on planet Earth are able to think of. And so, he has ministered, he has provided for himself, and to them that were with me. In other words, he also took care of others who worked with him. And then he goes on, verse 35. He says this, I've showed you all things that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, a lot of people wonder, where was Paul? How would he know the words of the Lord Jesus? Well, perhaps Paul was around when he heard and heard from the Lord Jesus. There were many people who attended many of those outside uh, sermons that Jesus gave. Remember, Jesus was in Jerusalem for a whole week prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. On the date that I'm um, recording this message, which is on March the 24th, we're coming up with what is referred to in the Christian calendar as Palm Sunday. It is the week leading up to Jesus' triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem and his coming and eventual his triumph on the cross. That's how triumphant he was. He says here that it is more blessed to receive. Perhaps uh, Paul was there. Paul, you see, was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the, of the Sanhedrin, therefore. And so, you see, he was of the leadership of the house of Israel, I wonder sometimes if Paul was there the night that Jesus was condemned to death. And so he firsthand heard Jesus. I wonder if that has happened. Now, there's nothing absolute that tells us this in Scripture, but we can take by inference here that perhaps this was the case. And he quotes Jesus here, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, oftentimes I've heard this verse misused and saying, you should give everything away and not, and not own anything. It's, you see, it's better to give than to receive anything. Well, that's not what is at play here. What God is saying through the Apostle Paul here is he uh, quotes Jesus is that you can receive the blessing of God by being willing to give of yourself beyond the ability that you even have. There have been times that we have given things to people, finances, um, furniture, other kinds of things. We've just given things to people because they had need. And oftentimes I look back and I wonder how we were able to do all of that and still continue as we have continued over the years. Well, we were able to do all those things because God knows it is more blessed to give than to receive. And God's blessing was the peace of knowing that he remained in charge in our lives. And number two, that I have absolutely no doubt that he will take care of us here on this earth now. 
I look at uh, how we are supported on a monthly, uh, weekly, monthly, annual basis by people uh, within his church, literally from around the world, finances that are, are given for us to continue the work, such as what I'm doing here right now. Uh, the, the witnessing work to Jewish and Gentile people alike, which today on the um, day I'm recording this, I can tell you that one Jewish person heard from me today about the fact that I'm a Jewish Christian and put the question to them as, as gently as possible about where they are in their life as a Jewish person. So you see, the word continues to go forward. We may be in what is referred to here in Ontario, Canada, in a, a red zone because of COVID-19. But if you're looking in live, and some are right now, or you look in later, and I know some do because I see the number of views that come up on the, on, on the uh, analytics of our YouTube channel, we may be locked down, but we're not locked out. So the gospel continues to go forward. And even though Paul is being warned, don't go, don't go, he says, I'm going. And even though Paul is going in his own spirit to Jerusalem, as this passage now concludes the beginning part of, or the middle part of this journey back to Jerusalem, the one thing that will come of all of this is that God will use it for his glory in the end. It's not about Paul. It's not about me. It's not about any of us. It is about God receiving the glory in the end for who he is and what he has done. Who is he? He's the creator and owner of all things. What has he done? He lowered himself to a human condition in the person of Jesus and willingly allowed himself to be executed in my place, your place. Where do you sit with that? Verse 36, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. The key to any ministry is exactly what we read here. He kneeled down. He prayed. I read recently, I forget the author of this uh, quote, but it is not mine. The church has always gone forward as an army on its knees. You've heard the stories of armies marching forward. Well, guess what? Armies go, the army of God goes forward on its knees in prayer. Uh, I don't get down on my knees much anymore. I've had them both replaced. It's a little hard to get up afterwards. But the bottom line is that it's getting down on your knees from within you, yourself, deep within you, the, the deep, heartfelt desire to be in the right place with God. Get on your knees before God in prayer. And this is what Paul lives out by example here in front of these believers who are sorrowing. They're never going to see him again. But as we looked at those verses early on in the beginning of this message, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear, and I always add, of remembrance, because that's what it means. Why would God give you to an eternity with him, but remembering those who did not make it with you because they refused? So all we can do here in the present tense now is be a witness for the Lord Jesus. I was telling somebody yesterday online, again, another interaction that we have. Again, we're not, we may be locked down, but not locked out. I said, what you need to do is seize the moment. This is one of the most important times in human history. I believe God's been trying to get our attention, and this is the opportunity to share the gospel with other people. Can I challenge you to share the gospel with other people. And then we go on and we, he says there, they wept sore, they fell on his neck, they kissed him, they sorrowed most of all for the words he spoke that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. You see, it went forward. Paul is off to Jerusalem, but Paul will be taken care of when he gets there. You too will be taken care of. Can I encourage you to be a follower of the Lord Jesus in such a way that you are going to be taken care of beyond your capabilities to imagine and understand. We are Faith Ministry, as I've mentioned, and we ask you to consider looking at our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org, where you can find how you can participate in this ministry. If you feel led of the Lord to give to this ministry, please do. Um, you can find our address there. Um, in Canada and the USA, which is I Hope USA, 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio. 
You also can find uh, that in Canada you can give an e-transfer or PayPal can be used. We just praise God for those of you who have come alongside of us. Let's close our time in prayer today. Father God, thank you again for Jesus, for eternal life, and all you do for us. Use this time now we have had to give glory and honor to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So until next time, we say Shalom.